Another change, a new, a new development, will be moving to um, CBT, computer-based testing, in 2013. Um, what this essentially means, instead of having an old-fashioned piece of paper where you're writing your answer down on paper, um, the certification testing will be done online, which will probably make it more accessible for people in remote communities to actually take the examination. This is just the um, composition of the exam uh, for certified information and referral specialists. So it's broken down into six areas. The exam um, is um, based upon 100 multiple choice questions. I want to talk very briefly about 211 and the 211 rollout. This map is obviously not to scale, but it will give you an idea of how incredibly large Northern Ontario is. Currently in Ontario, um, there are seven 211 providers. And 211, for those of you who don't know what it is, is a three digit number people can call. Um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for free, confidential, multilingual information on social, human, and government services. Um, it is available anywhere in Ontario, so regardless of if you're in Tomogamy or Timiskaming or Timmins, you can call and uh, get a live answer through 211. There are seven operators um, in the southwest um, in Windsor. Um, all the way to the eastern partner, which is Ottawa, Thunder Bay in the north. There's one in Collingwood and um, one in Niagara, as well as Peel and Toronto, and they serve different sort of areas. There's also a new um, sort of governance or new structure for 211 in Ontario. There is the Ontario 211 Service Corporation, um, which is the governance structure for 211 in Ontario. Other changes that I've seen and been made aware of are how we actually learn as settlement workers. What are some of the new tools and resources that are at our disposal um, to gain knowledge and develop skills? One of them is a great um, online learning tool that Ocasi has developed called Learn at Work. How many of you are familiar with Learn at Work? Okay. Um, I've taken a couple of the courses at Learn at Work, including the Employment Services, which has a lot to do with information and referral, as it turns out. Um, and these are really, uh, I think, very good courses. Um, they're free, they're accessible, they can be done at your own, own pace. I have a confession to make. I am not a big proponent or a big fan of online training or webinars, I tend to get distracted very easily and wander. Um, but I think these courses actually are, are really engaging and they're useful tools for settlement practitioners and they're there for you. Um, so if you haven't had an opportunity to look at Learn at Work, um, I think it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to learn and develop skills. And these are just some of the uh, courses that are available through um, through the Learn at Work website. Uh, I've also done the Building Conversations on the Web, Five Good Ideas, a very useful um, course. And they can be done at any time from anywhere. Challenges. I think just change in and of itself sometimes can be a challenge. But I think one of the greatest challenges um, is really how do we measure the quality of our information and referral service delivery, particularly in a time when funders, whether it be Citizenship and Immigration Canada or um, Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration or even the United Way, are all focused on outcomes. So I think this is an ongoing challenge and an ongoing struggle for organizations that provide information referral. How do you measure it? How do we know if we're performing well? Um, and what systems do we have in place to assess performance? I profess I don't have all the answers to these questions, but here are a few. Um, and it's also different too, I think, if you're providing information and referral over the phone, like 211, or face-to-face, -face, like uh, a newcomer information center would, or a welcome center would, or if you're providing it 
online through a discuss, uh, discussion forum like OCASI. For our purposes um, at 211, um, we have a number of what we refer to as KPIs or key performance indicators or metrics. And I've just listed a number of metrics arbitrarily up on the PowerPoint, but I've only really highlighted five that I really think are important and meaningful. And the five that I think are important and meaningful are the ones that are highlighted in red. Client satisfaction, cost per call, occupancy rate. An occupancy rate essentially looks at the busyness of the service. Um, are we um, allocating appropriate resources? Um, are, do we have a good supply of staff for the demand of the service? Um, and first call resolution. Um, I think obviously that's a goal of an information referral service, is to answer the client's questions, get them the information they need the first time. Um, other ones I'm not saying aren't important, but I think you know, sometimes we measure because we can measure, um, but I think it's really important for us as information providers and as settlement workers to really identify and pinpoint, you know, what is it we should be measuring? What is really important? And then what are you doing with these measurements? How are you reporting these measurements out? Um, sometimes I think we, we do a lot of capturing of the information or capturing of client data and we don't do a whole lot with it. So don't collect it if you're not going to do anything with it. I want to talk about a new, um, a new sort of service that um, has actually been mandated upon our agency and other agencies which is um, called Service Quality Measurement, otherwise known as SQM. And they uh, assist organizations, primarily call centers, um, by measuring the quality of their service in areas such as call center benchmarking, call monitoring impact, first call resolution. And one of the challenges that this really presents is 500 times a month, we must get permission from our clients for them to participate in a survey. Now, how many people really like to participate in surveys? Probably not many of us. Um, I think there's some of the challenges with this. It's something that's mandated by the funder. You know, you must ask your clients these questions, and we must be able to follow up with 500 clients per month. Well, I know that the staff at our agency, and I know the staff at other agencies that are part of the SQM system, Really, staff don't like asking clients sort of questions uh, uh, about, um, you know, demographic information or information that you would normally see on a, on a census. And I think from a client's perspective, um, there is survey fatigue syndrome. People are tired of asking to be, you know, surveyed. Um, and I think the other part of this, the SQM measures client satisfaction. It does not measure outcome. And I think sometimes we tend to blur um, client service satisfaction and outcomes. It could be that you have the best job search workshop around and the clients are very satisfied with the actual job search workshop or the, the services provided by the actual settlement worker. But the outcome may be entirely different. So it's important not to equate client satisfaction with the outcome. They're not necessarily the same thing. And I think really um, when we're doing surveys, it should be done to benefit the client, not the agency. Or when we're doing follow-up with clients, it's really done to benefit the client, not the agency. And it's really what we can do for our clients, not what our, cli not, not, not what our clients can do for us. Um, one of the things that happened last year as a result of the SQM, and I think, I think it's a, a useful tool, I would, I would not use it as frequently as we are using it, which is every single month and every single day we're doing surveys. 
I could see us doing it on a quarterly, quarterly basis, twice a year basis, but not every single day. But one of the things last year as a result of SQM, um, 211 in Ontario, not our centre, but 211 in Ontario was awarded um, uh, by the SQM at the Call Centre Industry Awards highest customer satisfaction. Again, that has nothing to do necessarily with outcomes. Are we measuring satisfaction or are we measuring outcomes? And they may be two very different things. Just a couple of final points. Follow up. Um, how many of you do follow up as part of your job? Okay. This is probably one of the most important things to be done because this is one of the ways we can actually measure the quality of our service delivery and measure outcomes. And I know there's a few settlement organizations in Ontario that now have sort of changed the model a little bit. And I know in the United States, it's a fairly common model where they have actually workers assigned specifically to do follow-up. They are called follow-up workers, and that's all they do, is just follow up on clients, um, assess outcomes, measure outcomes, um, and, and see if clients need any additional support, help, or assistance. Um, and again, follow-up is part of uh, the standards, and organizations probably should have a, a, a policy or some sort of directive of when, how, and what degree of frequency you are conducting follow-up. Data and information management is an actual huge challenge, and I want to acknowledge um, people out there who actually are responsible for maintaining, updating, and ensuring the information we have is current because that does not happen just autom automatically. Um, it is a huge challenge. Um, and sometimes as a frontline worker, we sort of just take for granted that the information is there. It's available, it's accessible, it's online. But there is a whole lot of work that goes on behind the scenes, which we may not necessarily see. Um, a number of years ago, OCASI did a, a sectoral database study in 2004, so this is a little bit outdated, but I, I still think um, some of the points are, are relevant today. Um, Ontario settlement agencies are struggling with information management. I, I still think that is an issue today. Across the board, agencies are juggling information between multiple systems, doing double or triple entry of the same data, and generally struggling to, to keep up with huge load of client record uh, keeping and reporting to funders. Um, the report sort of summed it up in, in three um, ways, three words, fragmentation, inefficiency, and hope. And we've seen a number of developments since 2004. Some of you are probably using Otis, which is the online tracking and information um, system. How, how many of you are using Otis here? Okay, the, the Knicks are using Otis. Generally, it's more for mobile um, workers, like settlement workers in schools or um, settlement workers in libraries or people who tend to be mo mobile. But that's an example of um, a new system that hopefully is, is working well. Um, the other challenge is just developing partnerships. And one of the sessions of Canadian immigration sessions that we've been attending was on partnerships. And I think back in August at Wood Green Community Services, we heard about the local immigration partnerships, the consortium of agencies serving uh, international professionals, and uh, CNAP, which is the Community Navigation and Access Program, and those were um, all excellent examples of partnerships working well. We know that we are encouraged to partner. That seems to be a new, um, or a fairly new uh, phenomenon within our sector. There are actually grants for partnerships, and I know many of you last week at this time were probably knee-deep in your CIC proposals doing a lot of CIC proposals, well, a lot of them call for partnerships, and probably a lot of the proposals that you or your agency submitted were related to partnerships. Um, and I think it's important to get the partnerships right, because partnerships can be a real challenge. Um, and they involve multi uh, mutual trust and mutual respect. And sometimes there are, are difficulties in developing or sustaining uh, a partnership. Sometimes there are perceived power imbalances. Um, sometimes bigger organizations may be seen to drive the, the agenda. Smaller organizations may feel um, left out. Um, 
So while we're encouraged to partnership, we're also encouraged, I think, to be competitive, um, to provide the best service for, for the best dollar, to pro provide the biggest bang for the buck, so to speak. So I, I sort of see um, a, a, an irony where we're, we're encouraged to partner, but we need to be competitive at the actual same time. But there are reasons for partnering, and these are just a few of them. Um, there is, we know there's decreased um, government funding, and there is more competition for a smaller uh, bucket of information. Um, but there are benefits for partnering as well. There are different skills and aptitudes that different organizations can bring to the table. Um, but I do see partnering, it's being something that can benefit us, but it's also something of a challenge for us. Um, just on an end note, I, I just think the whole field of information and referral is changing rapidly, dramatically, as we speak. Um, how clients are um, accessing information has changed. Um, something I've observed just from a frontline sort of perspective is that you know, clients want information and they want it now. And because people think that information should be um, instantaneously available with a click of a mouse or a push of a button, it has elevated clients' expectations. And I think that has implications for frontline settlement workers. Um, I want to thank Doug and Lorraine for inviting me here today, and um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. <laughs>